<laughs> it's the first, it's our 11th session, but the first of 2021, right? If I'm don't, not mistaken. Yes, it's the seventh. So yeah, a lot has been going on, sorry, <laughs> in this year. Um, um, so this is our 11th session of the chair Carlos Chagas Filho on uh, biology and medicine frontiers, uh, organized by the Brazilian High uh, Studies College of UFRJ. Uh, today's topic is muscle plasticity and differentiation uh, from illness to uh, exercise. Uh, I am truly thrilled to be here today and uh, uh, I would like to introduce to you our speakers of the day. So we will start with uh, Professor Simon Hughes, uh, who is an MRC scientist and professor of developmental cell biology. Uh, in London. He studied biochemistry and did his PhD at the University of Cambridge, followed by a postdoctoral training with uh, Dr. Martin Raff at uh, UCL and Professor Ellen McBlough at Stanford University. He leads the Muscle Growth and Repair Laboratory at uh, King's College London for a little while now, uh, where he undertakes molecular genetics, cell biology, biophysical approaches to study and understand development, growth, and repair of skeletal and cardiac muscles in different uh, vertebrate models, uh, mainly zebrafish, uh, if I understood correctly. His current uh, interests include uh, etiology and, preve and prevention of aging-related muscle weakening, mechanisms uh, of mechanosensing and muscle growth, uh, muscle stem cell diversity and regulation, uh, inherited muscle diseases and their treatments, as well as evolutionary biology of striated muscle. Today, you, Professor Hughes will talk to us about muscle as an essential animal feature in aging. Um, we, will, uh, we will be followed by uh, Professor Claudia Mermelstein from UFRJ. Professor Claudia, she studied biology, genetics and ecology at UFRJ and did her master and PhD in biophysics at the same university, followed by a postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania. Professor Claudia is full professor at uh, Biomedical Science Institute at UFRJ, level one CNPQ research fellow, research scientist of the Rio de Janeiro State, is vice coordinator of the Morphological Science Graduate Program, as well as research coordinator at the Oncology Graduate uh, Program. Her main interests uh, include the role of different cell signaling pathways regulating skeletal muscle differentiation, myogenesis, cytoskeleton, and cancer. Today, Professor Claudio will talk to us about unraveling the muscle fiber uh, formation. And uh, finally, we will have uh, Professor Veronica Salerno. Uh, Professor Veronica, she studied biolog biological sciences at Universidade de Gama Filho followed by a master and PhD in biochemical chemistry at UFRJ. Professor Veronica Salerno Pinto then did her postdoctoral training at the McCollin Research Institute. She's associate professor at UFRJ. Her scientific interests include biochemistry of the physical exercise, non-conventional myosins and intracellular transport, physiological and biochemistry markers in response to volume, intensity, frequency of aerobic training and force. And today, Professor Veronica Salerno will talk to us about the impact of physical activity on health. So it's a, truly a pleasure to welcome you all. And we'll start with Professor Hughes, please. Uh, we, I will ask all participants, except for the speakers, to keep their microphones off, please, uh, in order to make sure we all listen well. And uh, Professor Simon, if you would like to go ahead and um, share your screen, that would be lovely. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yes, all well? Good. All good. Uh, so thanks very much for the invitation to uh, speak to you today. Uh, it, it's really great fun. And I, I want to talk about um, some thoughts on uh, sarcopenia and muscle growth and why we would study them in, in zebrafish. Um, and the, I'm going to try and get through three stories, an unpublished one from a PhD student, Mike Atwaters and postdoc Graham Matilli. Uh, and then uh, depending on how the time goes, uh, two recently published papers, one from postdoc Jeff Kellu and another from postdoc uh, Massimo Ganassi. 
So um, we have known for 3,000 or more than 3,000 years that uh, activity uh, from the nerve is necessary uh, for muscle um, growth uh, and maintenance, uh, as you can see uh, in this Egyptian drawing. Um, uh, but uh, in, in, in modern life, um, uh, there's a, 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 a problem for people my age, um, which is that our muscle tends to weaken uh, as we get old. And, and one of the things that happens is we lose motor neurons and those motor neurons then uh, would have innovated muscle fibers. Uh, the the, the uh, surviving motor neurons then innovate the fibers that have been denovated uh, and they uh, try and maintain them, but that system doesn't work well. Um, and uh, although you can do weights uh, and you can um, uh, exercise and you can maintain your muscle mass to a certain extent, the sad truth is uh, that as you get older, uh, your muscle uh, gets smaller. And you can see that people differ at all ages as to how much muscle they have, uh, but we're on a downward curve. Uh, and we know uh, from studies from many, many uh, labs and, and, and people around the world that um, about half of this uh, decline is probably uh, due to our genetics. And the other half uh, is probably due to uh, what might generally be classed as environmental influences. But those environmental influences can be things that happen to us at these times, or they could be things that happen to us at other times in our lives. And by and large, we know very little about either the genetics or the uh, environmental factors uh, that control this, except, as I mentioned, um, for exercise. So if we look at the legs of, of some people, uh, here's a, a young uh, chap, and he's got a lot of muscle in his leg. Uh, and here's an old chap who uh, likes to drink beer and, and, and sit at the bar. Uh, and uh, he's got not much muscle and an awful lot of fat. Um, but as I, as I mentioned, the good news is that if the old chap um, keeps exercising through his life, uh, some of us uh, are lucky enough to maintain our muscle. Um, but uh, you can take two people who have the same amount of muscle and do the same amount of exercise, and one will age well, and another will age poorly and end up very frail. And of course, that is hugely bad for society. Uh, well, for the individual, first of all, for their family next, because they become dependent upon much more help. Uh, typically, people may, old lady may fall over and break her hip, and then her muscle wastes more, and then she never walks again. Um, and of course, for society, uh, in Britain last year, uh, it was about $3 billion, US dollars, uh, to um, the costs associated with sarcopenia, aging-related muscle weakening, it's estimated. So what uh, one would like to know is where this problem for all of us, because it does affect everybody as they get older, uh, comes from. Uh, uh, what, we, uh, what causes it, what we might do about it, how we might delay it um, uh, and keep everybody more active uh, into their older age. And a second thing that is really interesting uh, about uh, this this difference between inactive and active people, of course, is that if you talk to sports scientists, they'll tell you that the thing that's really important uh, to maintain muscle mass or to build muscle mass is to go to the gym and do reps. That's short rounds of high force exercise. And everybody pretty much believes uh, that, uh, the that, that the reason uh, why you have to do reps rather than other kinds of things like going running uh, is that it's the high force which triggers the growth. Um, but there's a logical problem with that view uh, that I'll go into a little bit more in a minute. Um, but just bear in mind that uh, there's a general feeling that uh, high force um, uh, is driving the growth, and that means there must be some method for cells to detect uh, that high force. And it must be working in muscle, and it must be orientated in the long axis, if you like, of the fibers uh, to detect the forces that are being generated uh, by the myosin. Now, essentially all cells in all animals uh, sense force and undergo mechanotransduction. And this is a very active area of research. So for example, 
uh, the hair cells in our ears uh, essentially detect force when we hear. Uh, our blood vessels, if you get cardiovascular disease, uh, you've had problems with the force, uh, many people have had problems with the force sensing uh, uh, of their blood pressure and uh, the flows uh, inside their great vessels. And of course, we all know that if we do a bit of manual labor, uh, the skin on our surface of our hands gets bigger, or uh, thicker. Uh, and so uh, our, our, our cells, our stem cells in our skin are sensing force and are responding by proliferation and, and, and production of more skin. So um, uh, this is a very active area of research, uh, but uh, we think that because muscle is a particularly active mechanical tissue, uh, one may be able to get uh, deep insights into mechanotransduction by working on muscle. And about 10 years ago, uh, I, I began a, a long program of trying in the lab to try and uh, uh, look at this issue. So why study uh, this issue in, in a zebrafish, uh, which, uh, you know, I would not argue that zebrafish are a good model for aging related sarcopenia. Uh, they do get bad muscle when they get old, but uh, that's not really what I'm going to look at. Uh, but they are an excellent model uh, for looking at how you grow muscle, as I hope I'll convince you. Um, so here is a five day old zebrafish larva. It's hatched, it's swimming around in the bottom of a dish and it's just about to start feeding. You can see its jaw muscles are, are um, in green, are uh, uh, maturing. And in red are the stem cells, the precursor cells for muscle growth uh, or, and growth of other tissues uh, in this picture. So um, I want to start by just doing that evolutionary bit and, and, and in case there are any, particularly in case there are any medics in the audience, uh, because um, I've discovered that, that medics don't get taught very much biology uh, and they often think that something like a zebrafish is rather similar to a, a C. elegans or a Drosophila. Well, is a fish, and various aspects of our muscles uh, are, are all shared and, and built in the same way. So one can use a zebrafish to look at how muscle uh, is built and be fairly confident that you're looking at something uh, similar to what happens in people. Uh, and the only other major model organism that's really used, of course, is the mouse. Uh, and you talked of the talk that there are some advantages to looking at zebrafish, which, which mice uh, are muscle aging than, than mice, but simply that they're a good one. So, one of those advantages is shown here. We can do a muscle growth assay. So here is a transgenic zebrafish with all of the membranes in the animal labeled uh, with GFP in the line of animal. And we can take Simon? Simon? Yeah, I think we have some problems with the sound. Can you hear me? Uh, more or less, it's like uh, cutting your voice sometimes. Oh. Maybe um, it's an internet problem? Odd. Just come back one slide, I guess. Back one slide. Oh dear. How yeah. far? Tell me when. <laughs> uh, no, I think, well, from here, from the beginning of this one, and then I couldn't follow you anymore. <laughs> yeah, me too. Oh, okay. I'm very sorry. Do, do interrupt me immediately if it happens. I can, okay. usually sure. our internet connection in the house is, is very good, but I can move to another part of the house uh, if, um, if, it, if it persists, this problem. Okay. Okay. Um, right there. <clears throat> so, uh, one of the advantages—it's—it's it's not working. Um, of using zebrafish is that we can muscle. So this is somite seventeen by the anus of the fish, about halfway along it, 
uh, and we can measure the length in one of these live optical scans. And we can take a uh, YZ scan cross section through the animal and we can measure the area of the muscle uh, like this. Uh, and we can count all the fibers. And if we'd labeled the nuclei in red, for example, in this picture, we could count all the nuclei in the animal, in, in the muscle as well. And we can multiply the length by the area and get a volume for this block of muscle. Uh, and then we can do the same thing again at later times and watch the growth of the tissue. Uh, and this is something you can't do in a mouse or a person. Um, so the first story I'm going to tell you is this uh, story that's about a new force sensing mechanism that uh, Mike and Ram have found uh, in muscle uh, that functions in response to exercise. So we can take our fish and as we grow them for their first three days, we can take them at three days old after they've hatched, they hatch around here. Uh, and <clears throat> we can um, measure the volume of their muscle and you'll see here that four different lays of fish, so about uh, uh, 10 or so fish from each lay have been averaged here. Uh, you can see that lays differ in size, but if we then measure the same fish again a day later, at this time point, uh, you can see that each of them has grown by about 30% in the muscle volume uh, in, 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 in these, uh, uh, over this period. Uh, and it's obviously much better to follow the same batch of fish and the same individual fish than it is to try and average uh, between uh, fish of various different sizes uh, or different batches of fish which differ, just like people, uh, in, in, in the different uh, place where they start. So um, uh, the nice thing about this system then is we can take a, an anesthetic, a general anesthetic, and we can completely inhibit activity in these fish for the entire 24 hour period when we can measure this 30% growth. And when we do that, we don't get any growth. Actually, we get a little bit of growth, um, but uh, no more than 10% compared with 30%. Uh, and <clears throat> then we can take those fish and um, we can do a trick that uh, Ram and I developed um, a few years ago, uh, where we showed that we can, that tricane blocks the uh, neural so sodium channels, but not the muscle sodium channels. So we can put our fish in a little chamber and electrically stimulate them. And if I get rid of this uh, um, pointer and go over here, if we give them a, a, a titanic contraction every five seconds, I hope you can see if the computer's doing it, that they, they, they undergo uh, a clench, uh, a titanic contraction where both sides of the animal are contracting at once. And of course, they don't swim away because they're anaesthetized and their new brain isn't working. Um, and if we do that eight hours into the 24 hours of stimulation uh, of anaesth anaesthesia, we can completely rescue the muscle growth. So we're giving just 15 minutes of electrical stimulation here at this time point, uh, and yet we can completely recover the growth. And so that shows that something has happened to the muscle. Obviously it doesn't grow instantly during the stimulation that has been remembered during the 16 hours and is leading to a complete recovery of the growth. And we think this is a really nice system therefore, because some things must have changed molecularly inside the muscle uh, uh, which lead to the growth and we want to go looking for them. But first we were a little bit worried that just electrically shocking our whole fish might do something nasty to it and maybe the muscle is increasing in size due to swelling or something something else. So Vlad Snetkov uh, got hold of some uh, channel rhodopsin expressing fish uh, from Claire Wyatt in Paris uh, and these express uh, channel rhodopsin, which is an optogenetically activatable uh, uh, protein uh, in the membranes of the muscle cells and only in the muscle cells from an actin driver. And when he flashes blue, Vlad flashes blue light at these fish, he can make them contract. You can kind of see the flashing and you can see the contraction shortly afterwards. And when he does that, he gets exactly the same rescue of growth uh, as we had with the electrical stimulation. So this tells us that growth is not due to electrophoresis or uh, some nasty effect of the electrical activity and that the stimulation in both cases works directly on the muscle fibers to uh, trigger something which causes uh, them to grow, the whole muscle to grow. Actually, it's interesting, the muscle fight, the major part of the growth 
is, is increase in volume of the muscle fibers that were already there. But we also rescue the formation of new fibers, which means that the stem cells that generate those new fibers are also being affected. But I'm not going to tell you any more about that today. So now we can ask, OK, what is this activity doing? Well, you all know how muscle contracts. Um, the motor nerve fires, it releases acetylcholine, uh, and that can be blocked, as I've told you, with tricane. We can come in with electrical stimulation and we can activate the uh, uh, electrical firing of the plasma membrane of the muscle fibers, and that leads to calcium release into the cytoplasm. And that uh, famously causes myosin to be able to interact with actin and to generate force. And so the hypothesis is, as everybody uh, in the sports science uh, world would agree, I think, uh, that uh, mechanotransduction from this force is somehow causing uh, the growth of the muscle. But of course, it's not possible uh, to dissociate uh, this process from this process, the rise in the calcium. And it's well known that calcium signaling in the cytoplasm of mu adult muscle fibers uh, changes the gene expression of the muscles. One of the things it does is that the pattern of electrical activity in the fiber controls the fiber type, the myosins that are uh, slow or fast that are being expressed inside the cells. And so it's perfectly possible that the, the, the calcium pattern could also be controlling the growth. And this is the logical flaw in the idea that uh, force must be driving the growth. So how does one begin to uh, dissociate these two things uh, and work out which of them is more important. Well, evidence that the high force is necessary comes from studies in people, for example, this one, where when you kind of match the amount of activity in some ways between people who do light work and do heavy work, you can see the muscle of the people who do heavy work is it, it gets bigger. But the problem is that when you do heavy work, you recruit more noton units. Uh, and different muscle fibers fire, and those fibers fire with a different calcium signaling pattern because they're going into tetany in a different way. And so you, this sort of data doesn't uh, contradict the calcium idea. But there is a way of sorting it out. And that is that 20 years ago, Tim Mitchison developed some inhibitors of myosin that are directly binding to the myosin head and stop it from being able to ratchet along actin and generate force. Vlad uh, looked at this to ask whether these inhibitors work in the zebrafish and what do they do to the calcium signal. So here's a normal zebrafish expressing GCAMP, a calcium sensor in its muscle. And you can see that when we give it an electrical stimulation, you get a cal green calcium signal. And in parallel with that, you get a contraction twitch. If we do the same experiment in the presence of BTS in the fish, you get a beautiful calcium signal and absolutely no contraction. So BTS is an effective way to distinguish a fish that has the calcium signal and the force and a fish that has the calcium signal without the force. And of course, I wouldn't be telling you the story if the result wasn't interesting. So we do the experiment with the stimulation and then we add the myosin blocker and this is the result. Just to remind you, active fish grow, anaesthetized fish don't grow, stimulated anaesthetized fish grow. And if we just put the myosin blocker in for an hour around the time of the stimulation, the fish don't grow. We can use a second myosin inhibitor BHC, which is chemically completely distinct. It's not known where it binds on the myosin head, but it does bind directly to the myosin, does the same thing. So we think that this demonstrates that you absolutely need myosin activity uh, in order to grow. So just to summarize so far, ordinary fish, uh, sorry, ordinary fish uh, have a nerve signal which drives growth. If we block that nerve signal, the growth is much reduced by blocking all of those steps. If we now block the nerve signal, uh, but come in and stimulate the muscle directly, we get growth. But if we block the nerve signal and si stimulate, but then block actomyosin activity down here, we inhibit the growth. Showing that there must be something of downstream of myosin that triggers growth. So you're probably, if you know about muscle, all thinking about torque one signaling, 
because it's very well known that in response to exercise, it's been known for 20 years, that talk one uh, <coughs> signaling can drive muscle growth uh, in some circumstances. And so, of course, we were up wondering whether activity is controlling talk one, and that's how um, the process is functioning here. So uh, we can use inhibitors of TORC1, rapamycin and taurin to um, address this issue. So here's an experiment with taurin where Mike has taken a, 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 a protein that's phosphorylated by the TORC1 kinase uh, for EVP uh, and shows that taurin inhibits the phosphorylation inside the fish. You can see it's going down. And then we can put the taurin onto the muscle of the moving fish and it doesn't cause a significant reduction in growth. However, what about the stimulated growth? So when we do the experiment with the electrically stimulated growth, now you can see that the taurin does actually have an effect. So the two to look at are the green and the black. You can see that there is a significant, although perhaps not a complete reduction uh, in the growth uh, of the stimulated growth when uh, we block with taurin. And we can do the same thing with rapamycin. So TOR signaling does seem to be necessary for this stimulated growth uh, to go ahead. However, is the question, of course, is, is TOR downstream of the actomyosin function? So to address that question, Massimo Ganassi in the lab uh, did some Western blots on another uh, TORC1 uh, reporter, a very sensitive TORC1 reporter, phospho-S6, phosphorylation of ribosomal protein S6, and what you can see very clearly here is that uh, blocking myosin function does not reduce uh, uh, S6 phosphorylation to any significant extent. Um, and so we think that actually uh, TOR is not uh, the, the directly downstream of the myosin and there must be another signal. Um, so we went looking for it. And the way we went looking for it was on the following logic. So Ram got together with Georgia Bergamin, a post, another postdoc in the lab, who's a, a great uh, RNA seeker. Uh, and our logic was, uh, if we stimulate and we generate this growth stimulating uh, signal, and we look very early after the sti stimulation, uh, we should see some things change which are important for the subsequent um, growth that would happen. Uh, let me go to the laser. Um, that would happen uh, in the rest of this 16 hours. So we did that. And to our own amazement, we found precisely one gene that with a adjusted, significant adjusted p-value went down in anesthetic, went back up in stimulated muscle and went down again uh, when we blocked the myosin uh, uh, by more than twofold. So this, this and this gene uh, we're calling forcin. I'm sorry uh, that I'm not going to tell you what it is because the paper is not out yet. And there's a lot of people, particularly uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, who, who uh, would like to jump on this. And, uh, and, uh, uh, but um, uh, there's also some IP issues. Uh, but uh, I am going to provide you with some evidence that, that Forsyn um, does uh, uh, does, does, is involved in growth signaling. So, First of all, though, I'll just confirm the results. So forcin uh, goes with qPCR goes down, up, down. Um, forcin is interesting because it's only expressed in striated muscle, both in skeletal and in heart. Uh, forcin expression goes up when muscle differentiates and then stays up through the period we're, we're interested in. And so the nice thing about forcin is that it's an enzyme. And uh, we can take the product of its enzymic action and we can add it to the zebrafish as a drug, uh, effectively as a drug, a force in mimetic, uh, and we can see what it does. And what it does is rescue growth in anesthetized muscle uh, of the fish in our, in our assay. And interestingly, if we allow the fish to be active and we give the force in mimetic, it doesn't uh, significantly increase north, normal growth. And we suspect that's because these very young embryos are basically growing their muscle at maximum rate under normal circumstances when they're, when they're active. <clears throat> we can do the same experiment in the myosin blockaded situation 
uh, and we can similarly rescue the growth with the false and mimetic. So we think this demonstrates that uh, the activity of falsin uh, seems to be important for driving the growth. Now there's an, another enzyme which is known to be sensitive to this falsin mimetic. And, if we, uh, and that enzyme has an activator. And if we take the activator to that downstream enzyme target of falsin activity, uh, we can also rescue the muscle growth. So then uh, that's really the story I wanted to, to tell. And this is our working hypothesis that we're, we're working through, that activity is driving actomyosin force contraction, uh, that uh, that leads to the uh, activation of forcin, which generates an enzymic product, which through targets uh, uh, activates growth of the muscle. And there may be more targets than just uh, uh, the target we've found already. We don't know what else uh, this, this may be doing. Uh, and I've also shown you that, of course, TOR is necessary for that growth process, but it doesn't seem that activity is working through TOR. So we think of this more as a permissive signal, but it's, and there are two things we're wanting to go on and do now. One is, of course, we want to uh, really uh, show that this pathway works. Uh, what I can tell you is we can overexpress force in itself in the muscle and we can partially rescue the growth, um, but not fully rescue it, perhaps because it's not fully activated, we don't know. Um, uh, and we're doing the loss of function experiments by genome editing in the fish. Uh, <clears throat> the second thing, of course, we want to know uh, is what the interaction uh, with force in, uh, with TOR is, if any. We don't think there's much interaction in that direction, but there could, of course, be some interaction in the other direction. Uh, and uh, lastly, force in itself is regulated at the RNA level, as I told you, that's how we found it. Uh, so this means we've got, got an immediate early readout, or at least a very early readout, for the effect of actomyosin on the muscle. And so we're going to try and work upstream from that. So that's the end of the unpublished uh, story. Um, how are we doing for time? I'll, I'll move on. So the next story, um, really derives from this false story, because uh, if you look at this picture, uh, we were stimulating, as I've told you several times, eight hours into the inactive period. And, and of course, we tried stimulating at different times. And what we found was that if we stimulate late, uh, it's basically there isn't enough time to, to rescue the growth, of course. Uh, the muscle can't grow rapidly in a few hours. Um, uh, so, uh, and if we stimulate too early, we don't really get much effect. And that's probably because the animals were being stimulated by their natural anesthetic. So, you know, this thing, signal kind of fades away and doesn't drive the growth properly. So there's an, a, an area of time in the middle, which is optimal for growing the, for the growth. And of course, that's at a certain time of day. And we, that, that made Jeff Kellu, a new postdoc in the lab, a little nervous. And so he decided to look at uh, time of day. So this is Jeff and he produced a PNAS paper this year uh, in two years of work on his own essentially. Um, so he's a good guy. Uh, and um, uh, the conclusion from his work is that circadian regulation of muscle growth, uh, regulation uh, uh, drives muscle growth independent of locomotor activity. And of course, uh, if you think about an animal during the day, it usually sleeps at night and uh, moves around more during the day in the case of a fish or a person. In the case of a mouse, uh, it's flipped. The mice work, uh, run around at night, right? So their, their, their circadian behavior is, is different. And this again is a, a way in which fish and people are perhaps a little more similar. So let's think about circadian rhythms. This is a, uh, of course, there was a Nobel Prize run won uh, the last couple of years uh, for this. Um, it's an endogenous biological clock that synchronizes our lives and the lives of yeast and plants and, 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 and every animal uh, with the Earth's rotation in the 24 hour period. And in muscle, um, there's some interesting data. So if you're an Olympic athlete, you need to get uh, uh, um, time adapted to your time zone at the Olympics because muscle, human muscle contraction contracts better and stronger, puts out more power in the late afternoon than it does in the morning. Um, <clears throat> this is controlled, it is thought, uh, by uh, the clock which exists, the molecular clock which exists in all organisms. 
uh, or at least all eukaryotes, I think, um, and is two linked uh, feedback loops. The main one is at the top here uh, and is made up of beam, two proteins, BMAL and CLOCK, which bind to E boxes, they're transcription factors, and they drive the expression of many, many genes inside cells, including inside muscle. And two of those genes are PER and CRY. Uh, and PER and CRY's function is to feedback and inhibit uh, BMAL and CLOCK. So you have a on and off cycle that goes every 24 hours. And there's a secondary uh, cycle, an accessory loop, where two other targets actually affect BMAL expression. Uh, so this is, is complicated and, and, and we are not working on the mechanism of the clock, but what we're interested in is does the clock in and of itself, as opposed to the motor activity of the animal, affect uh, the growth? Um, so when an animal is in light and dark, genes are expressed, genes go down uh, with a cycle. And that can be for one of two reasons. It can be a circadian clock control event or it can be a deal cycle that's controlled by light dark or some other zeitgeber as they call them, uh, an entrainment cue. So in the case of a deal event, if you remove the, uh, the, the light dark or the entraining uh, sig sig uh, signals, then uh, the uh, cycling will rapidly fade out as you see here. Uh, but in the case of a true circadian uh, event, um, the circadian clock persists after you say leave the light on all the time uh, and you'll still see the oscillating behavior. And in fact for circadian clocks in order to distinguish them from deal light dark cycles or other entrainment cues there are three major criteria that must be fulfilled. The first is that they must be uh, the, the circ, circ, I've already mentioned the circadian rhythm persists in constant conditions when there are no um, zeitgebers. Uh, the, uh, the second is that the circadian rhythm should be entrainable. If you fly from London to uh, Rio, uh, you will get jet lag and you take a little while to adapt, but you do adapt and uh, then you're on Rio time. And the third one, which I'm not going to deal with, but is important for poikilar firms like zebrafish, is that the clock must be temperature compensated so that you stick at 24 hours, uh, irrespective of whether you're warm or cold. Um, and I'll show you that the, uh, the top two and, and, and uh, basically the third one as well, uh, it, but I won't show you the data for that, uh, are, are all true uh, in the zebrafish muscle case. So circadian rhythms drive uh, cycling gene expression uh, in muscle. Uh, this was shown first, uh, I guess, by Karen Esser about uh, nearly 20 years ago. Uh, uh, we're using microarrays where about 200 or so genes changed, uh, many of them transcription factors or signaling. Uh, same thing done by RNA-seq now in people, in all, all kinds of things, uh, thousands of genes change. Uh, so which ones are deal and which ones are circadian? Uh, which ones are due to the different activity that the animal has uh, and consequent upon uh, uh, the, the, the either deal or circadian? And which ones are really due uh, to the circadian clock. So Jeff and I realized that we could address this in our muscle system. Um, so first of all, for the first few slides, I'm gonna show you things about deal change, just fish that are in light dark cycles. Okay, nothing about circadian yet. So we can assay the growth of fish over a day, as I showed you, and they grow by about 30%. That's the full three to four day growth. If we assay the same fish halfway through the growth period, we can see that in the daytime, the fish grow about twice as much as they do at night in the succeeding night. So there's a deal difference in the rate of growth, high in the day and low at night. So that's kind of interesting and slightly worrying for our stimulated uh, uh, timing experiment, what's going on there. Um, so muscle grows more during the day and at night, but of course the fish swim more during the day and at night. These are day one, two, three, four, five old fish and somebody's recorded the activity and, and you can see that they swim, they move a lot in the day and they move less when they're in the dark. Um, but uh, I think this exaggerates the difference actually. There's quite a lot of movement in the dark as well. Um, uh, but uh, uh, so, of course, I've shown you that we can get rid of this activity 
by simply adding tricane at the beginning and keeping it there all the way through the process. And this was where Jeff's result became very interesting because although the, uh, as I've already shown you, uh, removing the activity greatly reduced the growth, the difference between day and night persisted. So you can see that there is still significant growth during the day where there's no growth uh, at night when you've inhibited the activity. Very interesting. So this is really suggesting that the circadian clock and not, uh, uh, or at least a, a deal clock, uh, and not the activity differences are controlling the growth. So the next thing we were worried about was, is this a developmental phenomenon? Because uh, these are three day old fish and these are four day old fish. They're 30% they're older, uh, right? So they, they, they might just grow more early in their lives and less slow down their growth late, rate later. So we can do a really cool thing with these zebra fish. We can take them and we can flip the light cycle so that they have dark in the day and light uh, in what was the day earlier and light uh, in, in, in later. And so uh, simply by putting them in an incubator with the lights swept, flipped around. And very nicely, when we do that, uh, we see they grow more in the light phase, uh, in the older light phase now, and less in the younger dark phase, uh, flipping from, from the last time. And if we inhibit activity, we can see that that persists. They don't grow at all in the dark phase, and they do grow in the light phase. So this is either deal or circadian, but it's definitely not due to development. Uh, so then we can uh, ask about muscle mass maintenance. You know, what's the mechanism of this process? Uh, so we all know that uh, growth of muscle is a balance between uh, of protein turnover between synthesis on the one hand and degradation on the other hand. And what I'll show you is that both are being regulated uh, by the clock. Uh, so uh, on the anabolic side, um, Jeff used a nice uh, uh, fluorescent assay for protein synthesis, which uses OPP, uh, a, a basically a, a, uh, a, a, an antibiotic that blocks protein synthesis by uh, uh, being incorporated into nascent proteins on the ribosome and making the muscle fluorescent. Uh, and you can see that very nicely because when we just incubate uh, fish uh, in, in OPP, they, their muscle goes green and if we add cyclohexamide to block protein synthesis at the same time, they don't go green. And if we add tricrane, they go a bit green, but somewhat less green uh, than in the control. So, so activity is driving protein synthesis, uh, but there's more protein synthesis. There's even quite a lot of protein synthesis, even in the absence of activity. Uh, and if we uh, look at night, then we see uh, uh, that uh, basically there's still a difference. You might not see it in the pictures, but Jeff has quantified by, by uh, scanning uh, the, um, the whole stack of the computer and then quantified the data. And you can see that here, uh, that protein synthesis rate as assayed in this assay is lower at night. Um, and I can't quite see what I'm pointing at here. Um, sorry, because of the uh, picture of myself. <laughs> um, anyway, you can see uh, on, the, uh, on, on the bit I can't see uh, that uh, activity reduces both uh, peaks, but there is still a difference in protein synthesis between day and night. So uh, what this uh, tells us is uh, that uh, activity is helping to drive protein synthesis, but the, so the, the deal clock, the clock is also causing a difference with more protein synthesis during the day. Um, so uh, uh, basically, uh, I, I won't go through all the, the, the data in the paper. Uh, we've looked at TOR and so on. Um, oops, what's happened? There we are, sorry, um, just lost the lost control. Um, so uh, then we, uh, <clears throat> but uh, what, what we show is that basically that extra growth that's driven in the day by the clock kind of cooperates with the extra activity during the day to drive that protein synthesis, that anabolic um, uh, side. So what about the catabolic side? Because it's well known that uh, uh, in, in, in in um, various animals, including people, uh, that there's more muscle catabolism at night uh, than uh, in the day. And uh, the nice thing in, in zebrafish is you can inhibit the proteasome by just adding this drug, MIG-132 or, or other drugs uh, to the fish and then looking at what happens. And what happens is very nice. 
uh, you can see that uh, it doesn't, uh, adding uh, this uh, prote proteasome inhibitor uh, during the day uh, doesn't uh, do too much. Uh, but when we add it at night, um, it, it uh, remarkably, and this I find a very remarkable, I thought this experiment couldn't possibly work, um, it, it increases the growth of the animal specifically uh, at night. And that is uh, a clock related activity, not uh, a swimming related activity, because uh, it rescues specifically at night, even in tricane treated fish. So um, that uh, suggests that in the fish, in their inactive phase, there is more muscle catabolism going on. And that's part of the reason for why they grow more slowly uh, in uh, the night. And uh, that's also uh, uh, regulated by, the, by, by this uh, deal cycle, not uh, by activity differences. So, oh. sorry, have, have, have you lost me again? No, we're still no, okay. No, okay. We're still good. We are here. <laughs> um, so then the question is, is this the circadian clock? So the nice thing uh, that we can do in zebrafish is we can take the embryos and we can put them into permanent darkness or permanent light from the get-go. And then they are, it was shown uh, many years ago that they are not entrained, that they do not undergo this circadian, uh, the clock is never entrained. And when Jeff does that, you can see that their muscles grow less well in either of the constant conditions compared with the light dart cycling conditions. So that looks like the circadian clock is kind of necessary for proper growth. But of course, the best experiment to do is to grow them in the cycling condition through the first three days, and then for the fourth day to put them into constant light. And now we're asking, is this a circadian phenomenon? And as you can see here, both with and without tricane, the difference between day and night persists. And therefore, this growth difference is a truly circadian uh, phenomenon. And we've shown this in the fifth day uh, as well. So the last experiment I want to show you from the paper is to ask directly, is the molecular clock uh, uh, necessary uh, for uh, this function? Uh, and it is. So Jeff has injected into the animal RNA, including a dominant negative form of the clock protein, the, one of those two transcription factors together with BMAL that binds to the target and drives the clock. And you can see that that stops the clock because normally the clock cycles like this with low per one expression. Remember, per is a, a part of the clock mechanism, but is itself a target of a B mal and clock. And you can see that it normally is low at night and high during the day. But when we uh, block the clock, it remains high all the time. It doesn't cycle anymore. And when we do that, uh, we can see uh, the adding delta clock reduces the growth during the day uh, and increases uh, the uh, growth uh, uh, during the night, I think. <laughs> uh, so that delta clock inhibits anabolism in the day and it inhibits catabolism at night. Um, so uh, I'll skip over that, I think, and just um, uh, kind of summarize by saying, uh, you can see more about this in the paper. Uh, it, it's a little bit complicated, but the bottom line is that during the daytime, um, the clock is working together with probably permissive tor signaling to drive anabolic growth. Whereas at night, uh, the clock, uh, that there is a basal level of growth that's tor independent that's happening anyway in these fish. And there's a clock stimulated degradative process, uh, uh, which is kind of, uh, counteracting that and leading to less growth um, at night. Okay, uh, so how are we doing? I think I've come to the end of my time, haven't I really? Uh, yes. Yes, okay. Uh, so. so I will not <laughs> tell you the last story. I will zip through this. You can read about it. It's published in eLife this, this year. Uh, basically what it showed uh, was um, that uh, we can assay in adult fish or in, and in growing fish the behavior of the stem cells uh, that lead to muscle growth. Because of course, we think that for muscle maintenance and for muscle growth later in life, uh, beyond a one day time point, uh, their action is going to be absolutely crucial. So I've shown you then in this talk, 
that myosin function drives growth, that forcin is a downstream target of myosin, which interacts with TOR to uh, drive growth, that the circadian clock controls growth differentially in day and night, that the clock and activity cooperate to uh, promote maximal growth, and that the clock controls growth independently of effects on activity. Uh, I won't mention those two. So I just wanted to end by coming back to sarcopenia. So when muscle grows, and we think about growth in muscle or maintenance of muscle, we have to think about three separate modes of growth. One thing which happens early in our life is the number of muscle fibers that we make when we're children. How many muscle fibers do you make? Does the number of muscle fibers you make control whether or not you get sarcopenia later in your life? Nobody knows the answer to that. My hypothesis is that if you make fewer fibers, but uh, they may be good enough to give you quite reasonable functioning muscle uh, in uh, most of your life, but when you get old, uh, they may be uh, not that they, that may be bad for you compared with having more fibers, but smaller. The second mode of growth is just adding nuclei from satellite cells, from precursor cells into the pre-existing fibers. How many nuclei do you need uh, in order to uh, have good functioning muscle? And could we differ in the number of nuclei that we have in our fibers and could that control uh, whether or not or how rapidly we get sarcopenia? And lastly, uh, a major control on growth we know is the amount of cytoplasm, the nuclear domain size that each uh, nucleus supports. Uh, this is rapidly changeable. Most tissues can't grow in this way by increasing or decreasing the size of their cells, but muscle can. And uh, of course, how this mechanism operates uh, may be uh, very important for understanding growth. Uh, and we're looking at all of these uh, in the zebrafish context uh, to try and understand um, the fundamental basis of how you, how you grow your muscle uh, and uh, what uh, one might do uh, to enhance it or maintain it in when some of the signals are not working. So uh, the people in yellow are the people who did the work I talked about. Uh, uh, the work I didn't talk about was done by Massimo, uh, which was a collaboration with Peter Zamet's lab, where he now is, my next door neighbor. Uh, uh, this work was essentially entirely funded, I think, by the MRC, who employ me. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for the chance to present our data. Thank you so much, Professor Hughes. Uh, we have a little time for a couple of questions. I know Manuel uh, signed up, so Manuel, go ahead. Okay, so uh, first, uh, thanks a lot, Simon. Uh, great talk, very, very interesting. Uh, so the question is, um, is does forcing uh, uh, expression or activity changes during the day and night cycles? Um, right, great question. Uh, we, we're looking at that. We don't actually, we don't actually know yet. Uh, we haven't seen any signal in uh, the uh, uh, QPCR that we've done uh, so far. Okay. So just just a comment. Uh, should we sleep less to to be to have less muscle catabolism and <laughs> Ah, well, that depends. You see, what, what we show is it's controlled by the circadian clock. So you might want to go to Mars or something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you know, it, it, it may happen um, uh, whether or not you're asleep. Uh, the whole point really is that uh, activity is, is not what's driving this. Um, uh, it's the circadian clock. So, uh, no, I think the, the answer is probably... Uh, sleep is, uh, we know sleep is good for us, uh, even though it wastes our lives. Thanks. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, maybe we can, if people have more questions, we will uh, ask them in the end. Uh, Veronica, do you want to ask a question? Um, I'm on. Hi. Yeah. So I have, I have a two questions, very fast questions. First is how do you see the question of uh, microRNA action on muscle growth? Because there are some people that do the same exercise and the same intensity and so on, and they didn't have uh, muscle growth, some of them, and, and they showed 
there is a specific kind of microRNA that affects us. And the second is, did you try to see when you block the muscle catabolism during the night with MG132, uh, how is the function of this, the muscle in the, in the next day right. or? So, so about, about microRNA, I can say absolutely nothing. We haven't looked at microRNA, and our RNA seq done, was done without by throwing away the microRNAs, uh, you know, by size selection. Uh, so, um, so I don't have any data on that. And yes, that's interesting data. I'm by no means saying. I mean, my view is that muscle growth is going to uh, is a very complicated process, and many many things are going to be essential in order to drive muscle growth. And what we do as scientists is we set up the system to maximize the signal from whatever it is that we're trying to investigate, right? If we find a little effect uh, with some treatment, we then ask, how do I do this experiment differently so I get a bigger effect, so my graph looks better? Right, and 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 everybody does that, uh, and they all tweak their systems in slightly different ways for each thing that they're looking at. So that you know, one person uh, leucine, uh, get, you know, nutrition gives huge growth. Another person exercise gives huge growth. Another person the clock gives huge growth. Right. The issue is how do you integrate all of these together in one system where you can't tweak it uh, to, to to give a maximal effect to a particular stimulus. Uh, how does that really work in a real animal? And that's what we're trying to get at by integrating all of these things together in a manipulable system just a, 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 in, in these little fish. Uh, so that's sort of where I want to go, but I've got no data about microRNAs at all. Um, your other question uh, was, oh, I've already forgotten it. What was it? Just If you block the catabolism, the muscle catabolism. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, it this doesn't is, mean that the yeah, yeah. muscle that was not destroyed, it... It's, it's yeah, good. Yeah. Or, no, or it, it, good this is why I was so surprised. I mean, I thought this experiment couldn't possibly work, right? So, no, we haven't, you know, it's quite difficult with these very small fish to really assay the function of the muscle. So what I can tell you is that cellularly, <clears throat> in terms of the, the size of the cells and the number of fibers and stuff, they look fine. When we stain for myosin and actin, they look fine. Um, but... Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're, they're, they're totally okay. In fact, I, I would strongly suspect that they're not totally okay. Um, what it does tell us is that the fibers are able to, uh, you know, when we block the proteasome, the fibers are actually able to go and get bigger. Uh, so they're able to get bigger, even though, uh, you know, so, so why is that? Is that because proteins that would have been required to put membrane onto the surface of the fiber are not being degraded, uh, 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 you know, I mean, proteins of that sort are in the ER, right? <laughs> and so they're not really normally associated with the proteasome. Um, uh, so, you know, there, there are, there's a lot of cell biological questions that are kind of interesting to look at in this system to understand why that ridiculous experiment putting MIG onto a fish uh, actually gives you more muscle growth. I, you know, I just thought the fish would curl up and die when you did that, but they don't. So thank we you. Should, we should probably and move on, but uh, thank you for your, for your uh, questions. That was good. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Wonderful indeed. Uh, Claudia, yes. would you like to? Yes, I will share my, my presentation. Okay. Again, Can just you ask hear? people for the mic. Uh, yes, it's fine. Just oh, be aware okay. of your microphones, everyone else, please. Thank you. Okay. So, uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about the formation of muscle fibers. And just one second. And uh, I'm going, our lab works with two main uh, animal muscle um, models. We use cheek embryos and we use also zebrafish embryos. But today I'm going to talk more about the cheek embryos and we more specifically, I'm going to talk, talk about the in vitro cultures of primary myoblast cells that we do in our lab. 
and we have a general question in the lab. It's how muscle fibers are formed, and we have many specific questions, but today I'm going to talk about one, how different signaling pathways regulate skeletal myogenesis. And for that, um, I just want to talk a little bit about a general background on muscle biology. So I will be talking about a muscle cell and a muscle cell is the same thing as a muscle fiber and they are filled with many myofibers and myofibers are composed of sarcomeres and here I'm showing you one sarcomere and sarcomeres are made of uh, sarcomeric proteins and there are many different proteins. The most well-known are actin and myosin, but there are many others like titin, nebulin, desmin, alfactinin, C-protein, myomycin, and among others. And those proteins are essential for the contraction function of muscle cells. But there is also uh, another uh, important step that I'm going to talk about uh, today. Uh, so here is one example of a muscle cell culture, a chick, embryonic chick primary culture. And we can follow all the steps that we call myogenesis, uh, muscle cell or muscle fiber formation. We begin usually with mononucleated cells that we call them myoblast cells. And then we have a fusion step, a myoblast fusion step leading to the formation of early myotubes and then these myotubes will become major myotubes later on. And we can follow everything in these cheek muscle cultures. We have isolated myoblasts and they will elongate, they will align and fuse with each other, forming these very small myotubes in the beginning. And then they will grow forming these thicker and longer myotubes with many sarcomeres and many nuclei uh, within the cells. And if, if we look at these cells under the, a light microscope, these cells will contract. They, so they are fully capable of contraction. And in our lab, we use a lot of microscopy to analyze muscle cells. And we use mainly immunofluorescence microscopy to follow the distribution and localization of different sarcomeric and muscle specific proteins. So like this one that we are looking at the left at an uh, immunolabeling for alpha actinin staining the Z lines of sarcomeres. And we also do a lot of video microscopies to follow the dynamic aspects of cheek muscle cell cultures. So here we can see one muscle cell, one myoblast, artificially colored in pink. And we can see that the myoblast cell is rolling over a small myotube, trying to find a place to fuse. So in a few seconds, this cell will disappear and will become integrated into this myotube. So these uh, myogenic cultures are very robust and we have uh, it's easy to, uh, to follow many aspects of myogenesis. And one aspect that I am very interested in is in myoblast fusion. So myoblast cells, as I told you, they will elongate and align and will fuse to form a myotube. And there is one family of proteins that have been recognized as one of the main uh, proteins involved in myoblast fusion. And this family of proteins is the cadirin family. Cadirins are a family of proteins and there are different cadirins involved in myoblast fusion. N cadirins, M cadirins, R cadirins and others. And here uh, we stained uh, cheek muscle culture with an antibody against pan cadirins. So it will label all the cadirins that have in muscle cells. And here's a specific labeling. And here there is a specific labeling for n cadirin. Uh, we can see that the cadirins will form a line along uh, my, there is a, someone is with the sound, sorry. Um, n cadirins will form these very straight lines of adhesion. So here we can see two myoblast cells beginning to fuse. And here we can see three myoblast cells and they, they are engaging into myoblast fusion. And interestingly, uh, cadirins are linked to the actin cytoskeleton, and we have one protein that can link actin to cadirins, 
and that's the catenin family of proteins. And in light blue, we can see beta catenin. That's the protein that we label the cells here. And this is a very interesting protein because catenins, beta catenin, is involved in both in cell adhesion during myoblast fusion, but it's also involved in the wind beta catenin signaling. That's and that's the one I'm talking about today with you. So today I selected three different stories to tell you. Simon did talk about two different stories. I will try to talk very quickly about those three because they have something in common and I will talk to you at the end. They have the wind beta catenin signaling uh, linking all of those studies. So my lab did some studies in the last years studying membrane microdomains, lipid rafts, and membrane cholesterol. And then we did also some studies using the LMO7 protein. And more recently, we began studying lysosomes and LAMP2 protein. LAMP2 is a lysosomal protein. So I will begin by uh, showing you just the, the first study on membrane cholesterol and lipid rafts. So my lab, uh, have been working with uh, lipid rafts for more than 10 years. And we did a lot of work with these students, Deborah Portillo, Carolina Pontes, and Eliane Ribeiro. And we found that when we change uh, the membrane composition, when we deplete cholesterol, we can enhance uh, the formation of uh, myofibers. The fibers will be uh, larger than usual. And the whole process involves the wind beta catenin pathway. So uh, just to tell to this broader audi audience that we have here, a signaling pathway is a, a, a transduction signaling mechanism that we have in our cells. For that, we need an extracellular signal, a transmembrane receptor, an intrasignaling, uh, intracellular signaling proteins, and then one protein could be translocated to the nuclei and we regulate gene expression. And then the cell will respond either by proliferating, survival or differentiation. Today I'm going to talk about muscle differentiation and the cell signaling pathway that will be focus, focusing will be the wind beta catenin pathway. So the wind pathway is one signaling pathway among many others that we have in our cells. And just to show you the variety of signaling uh, pathways, and they also interact with each other, what, which makes things more complicated. And we have in muscle uh, development, uh, we have three major signaling pathways that can have a major role during the initial steps of myogenesis. And these signaling pathways are the wind pathway, sonic hedgehog pathway, and BMP pathway. So in this cartoon, I sh I'm showing you uh, receptors for each of these signaling pathways. I'm showing you also the extracellular signaling molecules for each of the pathways. And they all converge into the activation of one gene that we call MyoD. MyoD is a master switch gene that's involved in muscle commitment and muscle differentiation. And MyoD, can in turn activate the expression of many different muscle specific proteins that are some of them are myofibrillar sarcomeric proteins. So they all lead to this myoD uh, concentration of um, responses. So uh, the wind signaling uh, pathway, we have this uh, pathway in a turning in a on situation or the pathway can be turned off. In order to have the pathway on, we need the extracellular signal molecule, the wind molecules. And wind molecules are again a family of proteins. We have a number of different wind molecules in eukaryotic cells. And we have also two different receptors for this pathway, freezo receptors and the co-receptor LRP56. And we have again a number of different freezo molecules in muscle cells and also in non-muscle cells. And this signaling, in order to be turned on, we need wind molecule to, to bind to the receptor and co-receptor. And this will activate a signaling, intracellular signaling cascade involving these proteins, JSK3 beta, 
axing this shovel and APC, among others. And then this will lead uh, to the final event, that's the translocation of beta-catenin to the nuclear, to the nucleus of the cells. And beta-catenin will then uh, regulate gene expression, activating many genes, including myoD, and then including many myofibrillar proteins. So beta-catenin is highly involved in uh, muscle development. But things are never um, simple in biology. So uh, besides the canonical wind pathway, there are others non-canonical wind pathways. The interesting, and the interesting thing is that beta-catenin, uh, it's dependent, it's part of the canonical pathway. This pathway depends on beta-catenin and the other non-canonical pathways are beta-catenin independent. So today I'm going to concentrate on one wind molecule that's part of the canonical wind pathway, wind 3A, and one, one wind molecule that's a representative of the non-canonical wind pathway, that's wind 5A. So what we did uh, in our lab a few years ago is that we decided to test, to probe um, uh, different uh, molecules or drugs that could activate or inhibit the wind beta catenin pathway using these chick primary muscle cultures. So we decided to use two activators and two inhibitors of the wind beta catenin pathway. The activators were wind 3A, that can bind to the receptors and activate all the signaling cascade. And we also use it BIO. BIO is an inhibitor of the enzyme JSK3 beta. And when the enzyme is inhibited, beta catenin is now free to be translocated to the nucleus. So we use uh, these three activators and two inhibitors. One was the DKK1, which inhibits the co-receptor LRP56, and, that, and in this way prevents wind binding to the receptor. And the other inhibitor is called Frisbee. Frisbee, uh, Frizzle, it's uh, like a similar molecule as compared to the Frizzle receptor. And Frizzle will then bind to wind molecules and prevent wind binding to the real receptor at the plasma membrane. So those four molecules were tested in our uh, chick myogenic cultures, and I will show you uh, in, in the following slides. So wind 3A, we found that uh, it promotes the enlargement, the growth of muscle fibers. We could see in the culture very large and thick myotubes, whereas wind 5A, the non-canonical wind molecule, inhibits muscle formation. So we hardly could find um, myotubes in the same size as the control culture. We also uh, show the same effect of wind 3 a using immunofluorescence microscopy, just to show that the myotubes were completely filled with sarcomeric structures. So it was a fully contracting and normal myotube, but a very thick one. So we also tested the inhibitor, Frisbee, and we found that Frisbee could inhibit muscle formation, muscle fiber formation. And we also tested the other inhibitor, DKK1. And we found again that DKK1 completely inhibited myofiber formation, as you can see here. And finally, we tested the effects of bio, bio, which is an activator of the wind pathway. And here I'm showing you a different analysis. We just analyzed the number of nuclei in the whole culture and the number of cells within myotubes. And we saw an increase in myoblast proliferation and also an increase in myoblast fusion. So here we have the whole results. Uh, they, they are all showed in the same uh, graph. And you can see that we have myoblast fusion uh, in the control situation. And when we treat cells with either bio or wind 3A, both are activators of the wind beta catenin pathway, the canonical pathway. We have an increase in myoblast fusion and we, an increase in the in myoblast, uh, in myotube size, myotube thickness. And when we treat cells with uh, wind 5A, which is in the non-canonical wind representative, and also the inhibitors of the canonical pathway, they all inhibited 
muscle myoblast formation, fusion, and also myoblast uh, deformation of myotomes. Those were made, those analyses were made by the percentage of nuclei contained in alpha actinin positive myotubes or also with myosin heavy chain positive myotubes. So uh, after this analysis, we decided to do an RNA sec, a transcriptome analysis of uh, chick myogenic cultures. And we found that the most frequent mRNAs found in these cultures was of the protein LMO7. I will tell you a little bit about the protein in the next slides. But also we found a number of mRNAs related to proteins present in lysosomes. And then that those will be the two next stories that I'm going to tell you, LMO7 and lysosomes. And that, that's why those stories are all connected. So uh, to tell you a little bit about this LMO7 protein, uh, this is a protein that's very interesting, very similar to beta-catenin in the way that uh, LMO7 can be found at the cell-cell adhesion sites. So in the, the sites where a myoblast will adhere to another myoblast cell, but LMO7 can also uh, be translocated to the nucleus of cells and also can regulate gene expression in a similar way as beta-catenin do. So it has been shown that in C2, C12 cells, the cell lineage C2, C12, uh, LMO7 is particularly found within the nuclei of cells. It is regulating gene expression at the myoblast phase. And when myotubes or muscle fibers are formed, LMO7 exits the nuclei of these cells, and it's found in the cytoplasm of the cells and also in the perinuclear area. So there is a shift from LMO7 localization from the nucleus to the cytoplasm along myogenic differentiation. So we decided to analyze uh, if this is the same situation in chick myogenic cells. So we do some immunolabeling of LMO7 in these cultures, and we found exactly the same uh, situation as was described in C2, C12 cells. LMO7 was found concentrated in the, within the nuclei of mononucleated myoblast cells and was found in the cytoplasm and and in the perinuclear area of myotubes or muscle fibers. And here I show you in a cartoon, LMO7 concentrated within the nuclei of myoblast cells and in the perinuclear area of myotubes. Uh, we decided to knock down, downregulate LMO7 in chick muscle cells, and we designed three different siRNAs to inhibit the translation of LMO7. And when we did that, we found that LMO7, uh, when we have a downregulation of LMO7, we also found an inhibition in muscle fiber formation. Cells that lack LMO7 translation uh, showed uh, very thin myotubes. We, we saw uh, less myotubes, and the few myotubes that we saw, they were thinner than the control situation. So LMO7 could uh, inhibit uh, myogenesis. So we decided to test whether we could rescue the LMO7 phenotype using either uh, WIND3A enriched medium or bio. Uh, just remember that both are activators of the wind, the canonical wind pathway. So what we did was that we knocked down LMO7 and we did also another experiment uh, that when we uh, transfected cells with the sRNA for LMO7, we treated cells at the same time with WIND3A or with BIO. And we found that both WIND activators could rescue the muscle formation phenotype. So WIND beta catenin pathway could rescue the absence of LMO7 in these chick myogenic cells. So those results were done by a uh, former student of the lab, a PhD, PhD student, Ana Claudia Posidonio. And that leads us to the third story uh, that's related to lysosomes and LAMP2. Remember that I told you that lysosomes were, are among the most ex, uh, expressed mRNAs in chick 
uh, muscle cells during the initial steps of myogenesis. Uh, just a little background about lysosomes. They are not only organelles involved in macromolecular digestion, autophagy, endocytosis, phagocytosis, but they are also cell signaling platforms. This is a 10 year story. There are many papers today in the literature describing lysosomes as uh, hubs for cell signaling. So many different signaling pathways use lysosomes to degrade some of the intracellular machinery of some of the signaling pathways, including mTOR, wind signaling pathway, among others. So we decided to do uh, two strategies. The first one is that we decided to downregulate the expression of LAMP2 in these chick myogenic cultures. Why we choose LAMP2? Because LAMP2 is one of the major proteins present in lysosomes. It's a transmembrane protein present at the membrane of lysosomes and is also involved in ion, ionic transport. So we downregulated uh, LAMP2 in these cultures using the same approach, siRNA to LAMP2 protein. And what we found was a similar result as compared to LMO7. When we downregulated the expression of LAMP2, we found an inhibition of myogenesis. We found a less number of myofibers, of myotubes, sorry, and the myotubes were thinner than the control situation. But we also decided to do uh, inhibition of lysosomal function. And for that, we used a lysosomal inhibitor called LYS5. LYS5 is a chlorokine and inhibits all acidic compartments in cells. And what LYS5 did was in, uh, LYS5 inhibited the formation of muscle fibers and also inhibited myoblast fusion. And again, interestingly, we decided to try to revert this phenotype by treating cells with WIT3A together with LYS5. And again, we found the same phenotype as we found trying to rescue LMO7 deficient cells. We could revert the at least five effects on myogenesis by using an activator of the wind beta catenin pathway, specifically the canonical pathway. So we found that very intriguing. Uh, those results were published this year by two students of the lab, Caio Bagri, which is a PhD student in the lab, and Ivone Rosa, which is a PhD uh, fellow in the lab. And uh, these three stories have, what they have in common is that, uh, that all of them uh, uh, needs the, or needs, or we found that wind beta catenin pathway could rescue those phenotypes. So uh, we now have two hypotheses to try to understand what's going on, why in chick muscle cells we can um, revert or recuperate all the phenotypes using the wind beta catenin pathway, only the canonical and not the non canonical. So, uh, is that a, a very strong, in a way, a very robust uh, wind, um, signaling pathway? Maybe in muscle cells, the wind beta catenin pathway is the major uh, pathway, is somehow more, uh, I, I don't know, more uh, relevant than the others. Or we have also other options. Uh, so we have now two mechanisms that we are trying to beginning to analyze them deeper. So I don't have specific uh, answers for them. And I decided to bring these questions uh, here today because this is something new that we are now working on in our lab. So the first mechanism is that maybe uh, membrane cholesterol, lipid rafts, LMO7, lysosomes, and lamps, they are interfering with different subpopulation of these myogenic cells. I didn't tell you in the beginning, but chick myogenic cells have uh, different phenotypes in these cultures. We have fibroblasts coming from connective tissue. We have replicating myoblasts. We have post-mitotic myoblasts. 
we have some bipolar myoblasts that are the ones that are elongating to engage into myoblast fusion. And we have myotubes or muscle fibers that are already formed. And we have also some key ascent cells, cells that re resemble satellite cells. People call them key ascent cells or reserve cells. So maybe uh, uh, the wind beta-catenin pathway is rescuing or all these phenotypes, but maybe acting in different subpopulations. We don't know that yet. And another possible explanation is that maybe those molecules and those uh, different drugs that I'm using are interfering with the wind beta-catenin pathway in, at different uh, uh, points of the, the signaling. Remember that we have wind 3 a uh, binding to these two receptors and then engaging these intracellular molecules. And this will all lead to beta-catenin inside the nucleus. And then beta-catenin itself will, acti will activate myoD and left TCF that, and they will both um, engage into the activation of those myofibrillar and muscle-specific proteins um, uh, synthesis in the cells. So uh, why this uh, only one molecule like WINT3A can have a very strong phenotype in this muscle cell, just uh, chicken muscle cultures is that's why we have these two mechanisms. I don't know which one is the correct and I will be glad to have some questions or insights from you to help us in this new phase. So I thank we thank all of the our lab group, former students and present students, and thank you very much for your patience. <laughs> thank you, Katarina. Thank you so much, Claudia. Uh, maybe we have time for one little question. Okay. <laughs> uh just because oh then we ask I, in the end so i we'll... have a i have a question may okay. i Please. Sure. okay so nice nice talk claudia my name is dave she i'm from the federal university of minas gerais mm -hmm. and uh, uh i i have two questions about your talk that's very interesting i, I actually i have many questions but <laughs> just to, <laughs> to 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 don't make any problem in your schedule. But okay. how L LMO7 is acting mm -hmm. to control the phenotype that you said here? Um, you you imagine how, uh, I mean, the, uh -huh. the protein that's regulated by this uh, transcription factor, because this protein acts as a transcription factor, no? Yes, yes. Uh, so you imagine the, the target Yes, uh, very good question. Uh, we, I had a little time to present everything, so I pass it very quickly in, very, in many of the results. So uh, LMO7 uh, is described as uh, having some similar targets within the nuclei as compared to beta-catenin. So there is one paper saying that LMO7 can compete with beta-catenin within the nuclei to bind to both uh, myoD and left TCF. So in uh, there are more than one paper uh, showing that LMO7 acts like um, a regulator of gene uh, transcription and using the similar sites as beta-catenin. I'm not mm -hmm. sure if this is the same thing that's happening in these cheek muscle cells. Uh, but but you, you don't have measured these uh, myogenic factors? No, no. In this work, no. We okay. just saw that we have more, when we treat cells with WIN3A, mm -hmm. we have an increased expression of beta-catenin within the nuclei of these cells. Okay. But okay. we don't know if, and probably we didn't test, but probably also myoD and all the proteins because we have a fully formed myotube fill it with actin, myosin, titin, and so on. Okay. But we, we did not do a PCR to, to test. Okay. And, and uh, uh, you showed some results about the, the inhibition of lysosome um, okay. to study myoblast fusion and growth. But um, 
how can you or you imagine that you can uh, uh, dissociate it between the uh, the effects on protein homeostasis, the proteostasis, and uh, the inhibition or stimulation of some intracellular signal pathways? Because we we know that uh, when we hit the out um, lysosome and autophagic lysosome pathway. Uh, accumulates some aggregates protein inside the, the cell and this uh, toxic to the cell. So yeah. what, what do you think about it? Okay. Or, or even remove some protein that's important in the process? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah, very good question. So LIES5, uh, we, in the beginning of the work, we tested different concentrations of LIES5. And I, I didn't show here uh, the viability tests. And LIS5 uh, can uh, kill all the cells when we do, uh, if I'm not wrong, uh, 10 micromolar concentration. So we decided to use a concentration where we could affect uh, cell viability in a very low level, like uh, 30 to 40% at the, at the maximum. maximum. So we don't, we don't kill off the, all the cells because we still have lysosomes, but we are also only down-regulating the, the appearance of lysosomes. So we have less lysosomes than a normal cell, but we still need to have some because mm -hmm. a cell needs to still, uh, as I told you, needs to um, do the normal micromolecular digestion, autophagy, and so on. So this is a very fine regulation. Uh, the concentration of LIS-5 was really critical in the beginning of the work. Mm -hmm. okay, and we did also a many, many other control experiments analyzing all the acidic compartments of the cell using acridine orange to see how the, the other compartments are still um, functioning, but Thanks. you are you are right. Thanks. Yeah, we still always, always have the problem of um, we need lysosomes and we can't get rid of all of them. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. Thank you, Claudia, for your nice talk. I would like to invite Thank Professor you. Veronica Salerno to please share her um, presentation with us. Mm -hmm. It's working? Yes. So, thank you very much for the invitation to participate of this talk and this conference. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And today I will talk, uh, I will give you an overview about the impact of uh, the health impact of exercise, impact of exercise on health. So um, to start this, I would like to show you this. It's not going. Okay. This graph that shows all causes of mortality reduction versus daily physical activity duration. If we look at this graph, we can see, for example, that <clears throat> Six, 60 minutes per day of a low intensity exercise like walking is capable to reduce around 20, 25% of all causes of mortality. We, if we start um, doing some more vigorous exercise and reduce the time, for example, 30 minutes, we saw a reduction around 30, 35% of all causes of mortality. In this, with this graph, we can have a good idea how important is the exercise to keep health. And I can tell you, exercise is a polypill. It's a health polypill. So why exercise is able to do that? Exercise is a kind of challenger for our system, and it affects all our systems, not just one. 
if we are doing some aerobic exercise, <clears throat> sorry, we have effect on central nervous system, in metabolism, in oxygen transporter, in skeletal muscle. We challenge all these systems, including the skin. And it changes the metabolism of these systems to uh, keep the exercise. And this kind of stimulus or good stress when the exercise is done in a right uh, amount of exercise, intensity and duration, the exercise cause different stimulus like mechanical load, um, increase oxidative stress, uh, reduce tissue oxygenation, ATP turnover, calcium flux, and this stimulus, this kind of stimulus, will activate some important pathways, signaling pathways, and these pathways will answer um, increasing mitochondrial biogenesis, protein synthesis and degradation, fiber formation, hypertrophy, as we saw, autophagy, uh, increase the antioxidant defense and cytoprotection. So it turns our cells, our systems more healthy. Uh, exercise, for example, here we have two kinds, two different kinds of exercise, an aerobic exercise and the strength training exercise. Uh, the main effect, but not only, the main effect of aerobic exercise is activation some signaling pathway that increase mitochondrial biogenesis, for example, uh, increase glycogen and triglycerol in the fibers, must buffering and capillar density, what is very nice because it increases the support or apport oxygen and nutrients for these muscles. But not just only this, uh, this kind of exercise uh, increases the synthesis and the translocation of GLUT4, for example, a transporter of glucose to the cell membrane. And it's very important, mainly for people that have diabetes or type 2 or type 1 diabetes because the exercise will help these persons to keep the glucose level in a good range. Also, it increases the CD36 fat acid transport, what improves the use of fat acid during the uh, metabolism, reducing, for example, uh, the storage of uh, fat acid in white adipose tissue, avoiding, for example, helping to avoid some metabolic disease. By the other side, we have another kind of exercise that is strength training uh, that the main signaling that pathway, but not only, the main signaling pathway of this exercise is improved, for example, protein synthesis, what will cause muscle hypertrophy. And it's very important to health because if we have more muscle, we increase the metabolism, the basal metabolism, avoiding, for example, the deposit of lipids on fat, fat tissue in adipocytes, for example. So in this way, we can tell that exercise in terms of systemic effects, it affects skeletal muscle causing hypertrophy, uh, affect the vascular in, uh, improving flow, vasoreactivity, and angiogenesis, what's very important also because it helps to control and avoid hypertension, for example. Uh, it improves the metabolism, what's good for diabetic persons or people that uh, to avoid overweight. It's for, in terms of cardiac effect, we also have a huge effect of exercise in cardiac muscle, increase uh, cardiac growth, cause ca cardioprotection, improve the function like 
increase in stroke volume, cardiac output, increase in the cardiac metabolism and vascular uh, in the cardiac muscle. So for uh, health people, it is, it's preventing disease. Exercise is preventing disease and turning our systems uh, in a better working form. But also exercise can uh, be used to help people that have some, for example, cardiac disease. Here we have a dilated cardio cardiomyopathy, ischemic heart or aged heart. If people do an exercise, aerobic exercise, that's the most re recommend uh, to this kind of diseases, uh, we will observe an improvement in the heart function, increasing autonomic heart rate control, um, stroke volume, uh, cardiac out output, also uh, increased mitochondrial function, reduces cardiac fibrosis, reverse the left ventricle remodeling, and it helps with arrhythmias. So exercise helps. Uh, prevent and helps in the treatment of heart disease. But if we look, uh, the most, um, the majority of the heart disease death, we can see that is associated to ischemic heart problems. Here we have 46% in men and women, 38% of um, ischemic. Uh, cardiac disease death. So what, what is this? This ischemic cardiac disease is caused by a block and some artery that irrigates some part of the heart. With this block, we have the uh, increase of reactive oxygen species, ROS, calcium, calpane, protons, and of course, we reduce the ATP synthesis causing a uh, cell death. But the worst part, what is uh, more um, dangerous or cause more cell death is when we have the reperfusion. Because when we have the reperfusion, we have a burst of oxygen and it increases a lot the amount of reactive oxygen species, calcium, calpane, caspase and it will culminate, culminate with mitochondrial lesion and cell death. So in our lab, we are trying to, one of the things that we do, we are trying to investigate if the exercise can protect against this uh, process. So uh, we use exercise and Look, here we are using not a training. We use just seven days of low intensity exercise. And as we can see here, here we measure the infarction size. The exercise after seven days protects the lesion of the heart. And not, not just this, it improves the left ventricular pressure developed by the heart. It protects the cell and get a better function during the hyperfusion compared with the control here. But also we, we try another strategy together with alone or together with the exercise. We use um, natural beverage that's very common in South America is a tea called Erva Mate that is, has a huge amount of antioxidants. Why this? Because when, as I show you, ROS is one of the worst things in this scenario of ischemia reperfusion. When we use um, just tea, the animals had a reduction on the infarction size area and a better function of the heart during the reperfusion. But when we mix these two strategies, we lost the effect. And the question was, why? 
So there is a, a kind of stress called uh, reductive stress. It means when we use a high amount of antioxidants, we block the adaptation of the tissue and also we cause oxidative stress in this tissue. So when we look this, we saw that in the presence of the T, we have a lipid peroxidation was increased as well as the uh, protein carbonylation, showing that in the presence of high antioxidants, we have a um, relatively uh, bigger amount of oxidative stress that caused a precognition in the state and protects the heart. And it's not seen in the other two conditions. So when we evaluate this to see what is exercise was doing, we saw that exercise does the opposite thing that antioxidants. It increases the activity of antioxidant enzymes protecting the heart. And when we have a huge amount of antioxidants, we don't see this adaptation and the effect is lost. So here I'll show you, show to you that exercise prevent, mm -hmm. protect, and can be very helpful during a cardiac event because it protects against the lesion, reducing the lesion. And look, it was just seven days of exercise and low intensity exercise. Another point that I would like to talk it's about the aging. Aging is a condition that increase the health problems. Why? Because we have, with the aging, we have uh, deleterious effects in many systems. We reduce brain fu function, cardiac function, lung, muscle, we change uh, body composition, and also we reduce the metabolism. And exercise is very important for this process to avoid this deleterious uh, picture. Uh, it increases, it reverses this. For example, uh, we achieve our, the peak, our physiological function around 30 years old. After that, uh, we lost around 1% per year. And if the, a person is not sedentary, if a person is an active person, it delayed this process for 20 years and it will start to loss around 50, the physiological function. And better, we will be in a right, uh, high condition in terms of physiology. We will start to loss in the up state, not in a down state, as uh, we saw in sedentary people. Another point here, so I can tell, um, also that exercise is a youth pill. But another problem nowadays is uh, not just people are sedentary. It's the caloric intake from everybody. We ate much more than we need. And of course, exercise try to counteract this, but we need to give a little help. There is a, I will show you some, some data in this aspect. And there is a famous uh, article showing that uh, these two monkeys and this CND, they had a reduction of 20% of caloric intake. They have the same diet, but just 20% of caloric intake. And as we can see here, this one, they had a caloric restriction, look much younger, although they have the same age. And also caloric restriction reduce cancer, neuro neurological disease, metabolic syndrome, and reduce the production of reactive oxygen species that cause the cell death 
and is increased during the process of aging. So, uh, in terms of metabolism, it's very good. So we think if caloric restriction improves the metabolism, as well as the exercise improving the metabolism, if we combine both strategies, we will have a better uh, function, a better metabolism for the animals. So during the aging process, for example, so we did this and here, we can see that the weight of these animals under caloric restriction were, they didn't gain weight as well as the group that combined caloric restriction and training. Here, the training was different from what I showed before. It was a high intensity interval training. It's shorter and, and high intensity and in a high intensity and have the same the literature show it has the same uh, effect of uh, moderate intensity exercise. So here we can see the difference in terms of weight. And most of the, this is associated with the loss, the reduction of fat mass. When we look at the skeletal muscle, we can see that the combination between uh, high intensity interval training and diet caloric restriction improved the cross-sectional area of the muscle. So the muscles are better. It means that probably these animals can have a better perform performance. When we measure it, we saw that animals that are under caloric restriction and training, they had a better performance than the animals that are just training, showing that the interaction between these two strategies can help a lot the health during the process of aging. And why uh, it's occurring? So probably it's turning the metabolism better so the first thing that we did was measure the glycemic, um, the glucose level after 12 hour fasting. And we didn't see any difference, but when we did uh, glucose uh, tolerance tests, we saw that in the presence of caloric restriction or the combination of caloric restriction and exercise, we had a better use of glycose, as well as a reduction in insulin secretion. What's very nice, imagine a person that is diabetic, that has diabetes. It will be very good for them. So, uh, but it, if it's changing this, uh, maybe it could be changing also or improving also the metabolism. So we to answer this, we measure the activity of the first enzyme of the glycolytic path pathway, exokinase, in three different tissues, liver, heart, and skeletal muscle. As we can see here, in liver, the exercise improved the activity of this enzyme. Uh, the diet also improved this, the activity. And when we combine the exercise and the diet, this get even better. In heart, the main effect over this enzyme is caused by diet. But when we combine the diet with the ex exercise, it get better. In the skeletal muscle, the exercise improve the exokinase activity. But when we mix these two strategies, it gets better. So it's using the glycose better in a better way, apparently. We measure also, I didn't show, uh, I didn't bring this data, but uh, we measure also the uh, PFK activity and concentration. And we saw that in this case, it was higher. So the question is, 
it's just turning the glycolytic pathway better or it improves all range of production, ATP production. To answer this, we measure the um, mitochondria respiratory pathway. Uh, so here I bring to show you the oxygen flux during the state three of mitochondria respiration that is um, couple state, a productive and couple state. So as we can see here, exercise improve the oxygen flux in the mitochondria as well as the diet. But when I mix each other, it gets better. So if we reduce here, the reduction of um, caloric intake was around 15%. We have a better improvement of an, um, respiratory pathways. And also the control, respiratory control of the mitochondria get better. If we look the diet and the diet combined with the exercise, it gets much better. It shows us that the mitochondria is more coupled. It's more efficient. But mitochondria is more coupled and more efficient. But the enzyme that does the ATP synthesis is answering the same way. So to answer this, <coughs> we measure the F1 FO ATPase activity. And as we can see here, in the presence of these two strategies, caloric restriction plus high intensity exercise, the ATPase activity of this enzyme is higher. It shows us that we have a better or we are improving the ATP synthesis, not just the flux of electrons by the complex, but also the synthesis of ATP. And as I showed you, showed you mitochondria is more coupled. If mitochondria is more coupled, I expect has a less production of superoxide, that's one oxygen reactive species. And then I expect have a less oxidative stress. To confirm this, we, or to change, to evaluate this, we measure the bio, some biomarkers uh, of oxidative stress. Here is a lipid peroxidation. And we can see that in the presence of diet and exercise, we have an important reduction of lipid peroxidation. And also, uh, protein carbonylation was reduced by exercise and by the combination of exercise and um, diet. In this way, I can tell you that exercise improves the metabolism. And if uh, we associate the exercise with a reduction of um, caloric intake, we will we still have a better metabolism, what improves a lot the health of elderly people. So uh, thank you very much. This is the, my lab crew, group, and this is Clarice and Katia, and also Antonio that work with oxidative stress. And here is Camille and Fabio that work with uh, ischemia in hyperfusion exercise, the effect of exercise on the heart. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Veronica Salerno. We are now open to questions. Uh, actually, not yeah, not just uh, for Veronica. First, for Veronica, but maybe if people have uh, questions from for the previous speakers as well. So, uh, please. Uh... May I start? Again? Please go ahead. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, nice talk, Veronica. Thanks a lot. Um, and I have a question about the. The fiber size that you sh you you showed um, 
in the animals that were submitted to caloric restriction and exercise. Um, if I'm right, you show that uh, caloric restriction exacerbates the effect of exercise on fiber size. I'm, I'm right? You show that? Um, no. Or I mean, not, not exactly this, because. In th uh, this one. See, uh, here I have an improvement of yes. uh, cross sectional area. Yes. And I believe. In, in terms of these this results, as well as, for example, for mitochondria, that under caloric restriction, you have a more, you need to have a more efficient pathways and metabolism and organelles. So it, I don't know exactly here because um, I do not work exactly with uh, muscle hypertrophy, but I believe that the, the combination of these two strategies um, triggers some better control of muscle. I don't know if it's higher um, because it will have, we had more synthesis or we reduce the um, catabolism. I don't know. Yeah, but this, this uh, I, I think that's an expected result, no? Because yeah. it's, it's a little bit strange that uh, you, you have, because this is something that for me is very clear. Exercise mm -hmm. and uh, fasting are pretty similar in the, the sense of um, metabolic uh, change and also Hormonal, hormonal change. So you have many changes in the organism that's very similar between exercise and fasting. So here mm -hmm. you don't have a fasting, it's a caloric restriction, but anyway, you are inducing many uh, changes in the body, uh, like insulin that's reducing. I, I imagine that you, you, uh, you show the result yeah. about insulin levels. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's not, it's not lower in the, in the group of uh, color restriction, or isn't it? I don't remember. Just in this group. Ah, yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. And this is spec as well. So if you have less insulin, and I suppose that you have may maybe more corticosterone in the, the blood of these animals, so you have catabolic signals not anabolic signals. I, I don't know. It's so it's, yes, it's, yeah, it's but it's, it's, it's something that's yeah. interesting. Anyway, it's something that's very interesting. Uh, so it's just something that uh, I yeah. was thinking here about to, to understand the, the molecular mechanism that's involved in this, this yes, effect. But as I told you, I think, yeah. and people that have been working in this area, they think that Although the caloric restriction um, reduces the nutrients, but do not cause bad nutrition, right? Uh, it um, turns the body in a more efficient way. You have a more controlled levels of hormones enzymes and so on. When I start this project many, many years ago, I expect to have a loss of performance, a loss of uh, muscle mass, but it's not true. And when I, I start to look uh, more careful in the literature, there are some um, athletes that use caloric restriction to get a better uh, performance, you know, so it's very intriguing, and yeah. we, we we start to try um, understand why or which which uh, is the signaling or the main thing that turns those results so different from what everybody expects. 
Yeah, and the, I think that's the most interesting because in the endurance performance is expected to improve because the effect on mitochondria, but muscle growth with yeah. caloric restriction, for oh, me, this so is the most, most surprising data. Yeah, and we have yeah. some great liftings. The, the guys that work with strength training that uh -huh. uh, use caloric restriction and also uh, avoid meat, for example. Okay. They are vegetarian. Okay. And uh, they have a very uh, intriguing and good results. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you, Veronica. Thanks. You're welcome. Thanks. Does anyone else have a question for Professor Veronica? Maybe I could um, just follow up on, on that. So Please. if I understand rightly on, on caloric restriction, um, essentially the animal is, is given a, a standard amount of food. So, uh, and will eat all the food that it's, it's given, I assume. Is, no. is this correct? No, no. This, in this kind of uh, caloric restriction that we did was um, every other day diet. So they have food for 24 hours and they stay without food for 24 hours. Because uh, we choose this because it's a little bit more easy when we, we work with animals. And, but and we control how much they, they, they had the reduction of caloric intake. And in this case was around 15%. And just this. So, but, and so, so, ah, so, so maybe, maybe my question isn't really um, worthwhile, but what, what I was, so, so did you see in the exercised versus the unexercised calorically restricted animals that they ate the same amount of food in total uh exercise and the control no the control. exercise and caloric restriction alone versus caloric restriction plus exercise yes yes so the, okay so the then if, they, if they're consuming the same total amount of food uh, and they're doing a lot more exercise doesn't this mean that their basal metabolic rate for everything else is going down? Did you me measure their basal metabolic rate? No, we didn't measure it. We are performing this experiments and uh, metabolic cage. Right. For, because obviously <laughs> the yeah. energy has to come from somewhere. <laughs> In two different kinds of uh, caloric restriction. I mean, eat the other day and also uh, reducing the amount of food because um, uh, the, this this kind of diet in the other day the animals the day that they eat they they have a hyperphagic behavior um, right. during right. around one hour and also they have some changes in in the hormones that control the appetite so. What, so what would be very what interesting happen with other other kind of diet so we are interesting to uh, compare both and see what happened and in, in terms of uh metabolic uh, basal state or using uh, uh nutrients because, because if you if you did a, a restricted diet where they ate every day but a small amount uh, then that might answer uh, david's question um yeah. Uh, uh, differently, yeah. Yeah. Yes. Very interesting. Very interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. Manuel? Um, Veronica, nice talk. I was just trying to mix all everything we heard about. And I was wondering, <laughs> uh, since you have the circadian rhythm, is something intrinsical to the genes, would the cells in culture preserve the rhythm? Would they have changed day, day or periodical changes in gene expression, for instance? Would be, I mean, could Claudia be able to see if she look at different time points? Could be she able to different to see different uh, levels of activities in culture? And uh, I was wondering because, uh, and if you could do in culture a caloric restriction or give less media to the cells and see how if the cells behave differently in culture. 
Yeah, it's possible. There are some, I think there are some papers showing that uh, reducing the, the amount of serum, for example, in the, in the click, you have a uh, similar effect what I'm showing uh, in, they didn't measure exactly this all, but they have uh, similar effects, you know, and there are some experiments going on for using the serum of the, these animals in a culture and see if there are something there, because another, another thing that I, I didn't talk because it's too fast, it's 20 minutes, it's too fast, and English is not my first language, as you, you all can see that. Uh, the muscle, when we do exercise, muscle um, release some myosins that are hormones, have hormones, functions, and maybe we can have uh, some different liberation or releasing of this uh, myosins uh, in association with exercise and caloric restriction, you know. I, I, we, we don't know yet. It's very, it's relatively new. Although caloric res restriction was described for the first time in 1945, the first paper or 35, I, I think it was 45, uh, it didn't um, move a lot. Just the last 15, 20 years, it starts to get more strong, uh, the results and the research in area. Okay, I guess we have... If I can uh, say something about the please, circadian please. aspect, Manel, <laughs> it's... it's um, uh, I was wondering about that with Claudia's experiments as well, but the, 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 the story with the clock is a little bit complicated. So when you don't have entrainment cues, so long as the molecular mechanism of the clock is okay, uh, it, it is thought that the clock operates cell autonomously in every cell and goes out of phase between the cells. So, um, so, so you might expect that that would be what would happen in, 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 in the incubator. <laughs> um, but on the other hand, if you open the door of the incubator and you cause a temperature change, that can is known to be a, 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 an entrainment cue. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, anything that, that sort of synchronizes things to the cells can actually bring the clock back into synchrony. Uh, and so, of course, because people tend to open the door of the incubator during the day and not in the middle of the night, um, mm -hmm. you have a, a kind of way of, of, of the cells becoming entrained. So we had to get a special incubator for, for Jeff and, 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 and actually measure the temperature change and, you know, only changes 0.1 degree over the whole 24 hours, which we were happy about. Um, uh, but, uh, but they say about two degrees change is enough to entrain. Very interesting. Uh, we have uh, some questions come, uh, showing up in the chat. So, uh, Dawit, if you, you want to go he ahead. And yeah, Claudia. yeah, yeah, okay. just, Please. yeah, just one question to Dr. Simon. Uh, again, thanks, thanks for for your talk, brilliant talk, very interesting your results. I I'd like to know about uh, mTOR that uh, you said uh, in the end of your presentation that maybe there is some interaction between forcing and mTOR, but anyway. Anyway, for, um, when you inhibit mTOR with the rapamycin or taurine that you use it, if I remember very well, I don't remember. Well, I think that was taurino. Yeah. So um, you, yeah, uh, the, the mTOR inhibition blocked the, the muscle growth induced by the electrostimulation, no? But yes, you couldn't it's, see it's these results. Reducing in, effect on the stimulated growth, but not yes. on, weirdly, not on the growth or not very much effect on the normal growth of the animals when they're just no, normally swimming. So uh -huh. we don't really understand why that is. Ah, okay, okay. 
So I, I think that I missed at this point in, the, in your presentation. So yeah, I mean, I, I showed it in the other order. I showed that that you know, putting in uh, taurine didn't uh, affect normal growth, and then I showed the stimulated growth and uh, where where there's this reduction, uh, which we were, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's not clear that it's as big a reduction as as the as the uh, the, the myosin inhibitors do. Um, okay. It might be a lesser reduction, but uh, my idea, our, our our working model, is that. It is that either um, torque can also affect forcing. That's a possibility. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but or uh, but but the activity isn't working through tor through changing tor. We don't think um, in this situation that the the muscle contraction isn't working through tor. Um, uh, so so yeah. So either that, that that's going on, or what. Tor is doing is, is one of two other things. It might just be permissive. You know, when you put in an inhibitor and you completely block the pathway, maybe that just messes up cells in quite a big way. And, you know, you just need some level of Tor activity for the cell to be okay enough to respond to forcin. Um, okay. Or it could be that forcin is some kind of gain control, sorry, Tor is some kind of gain control on the force in pathway. So that if you have no Tor at all, you've got no gain, you're multiplying by zero and nothing happens. Uh, but if you, if you turn it down a bit, then you're multiplying by a lower number, but you still need the force and signal. So, so you know, we're, we're trying to sort those things out. Okay, and, and about AKT, that's upstream to mTOR. Let me know that's another uh, kinase that's very important to muscle growth that can induce muscle growth independently of mTOR. So what do you say about that? Yeah, um, so we, we, we looked at that uh, and um, there's no change in AKT activity that we can see mm -hmm. at all under any circumstance. Uh, so, okay. so um, yeah, we, 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 we don't think that AKT is um, involved we, and therefore we don't think that IGF uh, and and you know other upstream things there are, are likely to be involved um, but of course until you do uh, real loss of function genetics uh, you can't formally prove this so so you know I, I don't want to say there's nothing happening but we we've looked and we can't see much um, suggestive of you know by looking at phospho AKT and, and so on um, and, and things aren't changing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Claudia? Yes. Um, you have a question? Uh, yes. Simon, um, I was thinking that uh, zebrafish, when we uh, see some works that they people do in the wild, in India rivers, uh, I saw something that uh, the environment can change a lot and the rivers can be very dark. And so, so there is no light going uh, when the fish is swimming. So do you think that during evolution, how the cir circadian clock uh, could work? Will be like a, a second uh, plan B? <laughs> uh, the, right. uh, so so, I, so it's, the whole, yeah, good, good question. I mean, I, I strongly suspect that the fish swim up to the surface sometimes and mm. and there will be other things uh, you, 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 I don't know if you know but in the circadian field there are all sorts of exciting stories so one of them is the story about the bat poo um, so there know. are these blind cave fish that live in they, they're blind so they don't see any light and they live in these caves in Mexico and um, they still have an entrained circadian clock which is entrained to the sun even though they live permanently in total darkness and it turned out when people analyzed this that it's because every night the bats come into the into the or every day I should say the bats come into the cave and they poo in the water that the fish live in <laughs> and that feeding stimulus is enough to entrain the clock for the fish okay. so I, okay. I don't think there's a problem with getting entrained okay. <laughs> in, in a, in a in a paddy field with a lot of muck in it. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. 
Okay. We have uh, one question that I caught in the, in the chat. It was for Simon. The person asked me to read. So uh, Jay-Zy, who's a PhD student at uh, Claudia's lab, asks, uh, does forcing link to, is forcing linked to another pathway like HIPPO pathway? And then could forcing uh, rescue uh, old adult fish? Uh, yeah, no, I answered that in the chat actually to her. Um, oh, uh, you did. But, okay, so uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Is, uh, we don't know about okay. hippo. Uh, we're looking at that. We've made mutants in in, in Yap and Taz, and um, and we're, okay. we're we're studying them. Um, uh, uh, but uh, the lockdown is having a. <laughs> the expected effect on those experiments yes. um uh, and no we haven't looked at older fish i mean I, I as i said in the talk i don't really think that looking at aging fish is something i want to do uh my my you know i don't think that an aging fish with its muscle wasting is really any better than looking at an age, aging mouse and it's certainly significantly worse than looking at an aging monkey or or person in some ways um but uh, so, so my, my view would be that the things we find in fish, we just go directly to the human population uh, and, and look for people with variants in genes or differences in lifestyle that affect uh, the pathways we're, 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 interest, you know, we're finding uh, and see uh, whether that's implicated. Yes, maybe we are part of a big, big experiment with this lockdown for a year now. We like our daily... Uh, activities and caloric restriction and sedimentarism i'm i'm asking questions <laughs> uh what are we gonna see <laughs> well, I, I in, uh, you know <laughs> all right <laughs> oh, the of we should definitely try to right? go and the absence of exercise. I don't know about caloric restriction during this quarantine. <laughs> All right. <laughs> no. Not too sure. Much alcohol. Yeah. Yeah. yeah too much and alcohol. sleep. Yeah. And also sleep habits. I mean, um, uh, it's uh, confusing, <laughs> I would <Yeah>. say. It's <laughs> true. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I would like to thank all the three speakers for the wonderful uh, talks this afternoon, everyone for participating and staying uh, over time, uh, and would like to invite everyone in two weeks' time, we will meet again to talk about animal models in uh, biology and medicine uh, at, in the Brazilian time, right? 6, uh, 6 p.m.? Sorry, Manuel, I forgot. I'm confused too, see? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I thank everyone, especially uh, Professor Simon Hughes, Claudia Mermenstein and Veronica Salerno and everyone else. And wish you a wonderful evening. Thank you, thank you. Bye-bye, thank you for being Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Uh, thank you very much. Bye-bye, thank you.